Hey all, Ron here from Military Images Magazine with a new episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. Today, I found myself in 1887 researching a Civil War veteran when I do something in newspapers.com that happens to me occasionally. That's my eye catches an adjacent article next to the one that I'm reading. And this particular article was a review of a new book by the man pictured here, Theodore Roosevelt. It's a book about Thomas Hart Benton, the architect of westward expansion that we know today as Manifest Destiny. Well, as I read the review to hear what Theodore Roosevelt's take was on the world at that time, I discovered a reference to who he thought the best Civil War general was. And so I'm going to read you the passage, but before I do, to give you a little bit of context, which I think will help you better appreciate his choice, let's understand where he is in his lifetime. He has recently lost his wife, which prompted him, along with other uh, situations, to head west to explore the rough and tumble landscape as a something of a gentleman rancher, sowing his wild oats, taking in the healthy air of the West, being out there with the animals and guns and shooting in the Badlands and elsewhere. I know you all have seen the photographs of him wearing buckskin and being a Western dude, or at least his conception of what a Western dude was. Well, around 1886, he came back, back east to New York and entered into a political career that ultimately ended with the presidency of the United States. A year after he got back comes this biography of Thomas Hart Benton, who was also a rough and tumble character from the West. So there's the setup. Now, let me get to the passage and read to you what Mr. Roosevelt, future President Roosevelt, had to say. He also touches on a little bit of the, uh, the rough and tumble will come out here. You'll see this in just a moment. The Western influence is going to come out here. So here we go. A class of professional non-combatants is as hurtful to the real healthy growth of a nation as is a class of fire eaters. For a weakness or folly is nationally as bad as a vice or worse. And in the long run, a Quaker may be quite as undesirable a citizen as is a duelist. No man who is not willing to bear arms and to fight for his rights can give a good reason why he should be entitled to the privilege of living in a free community. The decline of the militant spirit in the Northeast during the first half of this century was much to be regretted. To it is due, more than any other cause, the undoubted average individual inferiority of the Northern compared to the Southern troops, at any rate, at the beginning of the Great War of the Rebellion. The Southerners, by their whole mode of living, their habits, and their love of outdoor sports kept up their warlike spirits, while in the North, the so-called upper classes developed along the lines of a wealthy and timid bourgeois type, measuring everything by a mercantile standard, a peculiarly debasing one if taken purely by itself and submitting to be ruled in local affairs by low foreign mobs and in national matters by their arrogant southern kinsmen. The militant spirit of these last certainly stood them in good stead in the Civil War. The world has never seen better soldiers than those who followed Lee, and their leader will undoubtedly rank, as without any exception, the very greatest of all the great captains that the English-speaking peoples have brought forth. And this, although the last and chief of his antagonists may himself claim to stand as the full equal of Marlborough and Wellington. 
So there you have Robert the E. Lee, the anointed general, the favored general of Theodore Roosevelt. I kind of thought when I first started reading this that he might be leaning towards a Western general of a rough and tumble character. Names like Ulysses S. Grant and William Tecumseh Sherman spring to mind. But no, no, the lifestyle, the larger lifestyle, what Roosevelt thought of as that lifestyle, the outdoors activity of Southerners is what inspired him to make his choice of Lee. I also thought it was interesting that he noticed, or he at least pointed out early in the war, although he didn't come out and say that the Northern man eventually maybe equalized it. He sort of suggested it, but didn't come out and say it. Surely his sympathies were with the Southern soldiers during the Civil War as one of the strongest soldiers, if not the strongest soldier on either side, and Lee having the opportunity to command them. So there you have it. Today's story, Theodore Roosevelt. I'm sort of moving later in the century, which I don't normally do, but there you have it. Appreciate you listening. See you on the next episode of Life on the Civil War Research.